ಸ್ ಅಭಯ ಚರಣಾರ್ವಿಂದ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಶ್ಲ ಪ್ರಭುಪಾದ ಕೀ ಅನಂತ ಕೋಟಿ ವೈಷ್ಣವೃಂದ ಕೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಚರಿತಾಮೃತ್ ಕೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೌರಾಂಗ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಕೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೌರಾಂಗ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಆಭಿರ್ವಾವ್ ಮಹಾಮಹೋತ್ಸವ ಕೀ ಗೀತಾಯ ಗೌರ್ ಪ್ರೇಮಾನಂದೇ ಜಯ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಜಯ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಜಯ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಜಯ ದ್ವೈತ ಚಂದ್ರ ಜಯ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಜಯ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಜಯ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಜಯ ದ್ವೈತ ಚಂದ್ರ ಜಯ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಜಯ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಜಯ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಜಯ ದ್ವೈತ ಚಂದ್ರ ಜಯ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here today. <clears throat> so, I'll be speaking on the glories of Maha, Mahaprabhu from a historical perspective, as the title indicates, how Mahaprabhu transformed the course of Indian history. At one level, this might seem very grandiose, Mahaprabhu is a leader, of course he is a spiritual leader of a venerable tradition. But at the same time we talk about Indian history, so many things have happened in Indian history. So at that one level it might seem like an over claim or over glorification. At another level you could say it's like an under glorification. Because why only Indian history? Why not world history? Because Mahaprabhu is not just the deliverer of the world, he is the deliverer of the universe. So in that sense, we could analyze from various perspectives so the broad understanding is that god is so great that he outgrows any frame of analysis that we may use for trying to understand him so just like we have the avatar of matsya when initially satyavat muni got him okay he was a small fish and he took in his hands and then he put him in a pot then he put him in a pond and he kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger so similarly the lord's glories they are so much that they keep expanding and expanding and expanding so swayam eva atmanatmanam vittatvam purushottama nahite bhagwan vyaktim vidur devan danavaha that krishna after hearing the chatur shloki in the bhagavad gita arjun then speaks about his understanding of krishna's glories and he says my dear lord no one can know the expanse of your glories neither the danavas nor the devatas and who can know only you can know of course in the bhakti tradition further in the esoteric bhakti tradition it says that even god can't know his own glories but at this point the idea is that krishna's glories they outgrow any frame that we may use for understanding them but still placing those glories in some analytical frame helps us appreciate them at least to some extent so for example the word bhagwan is very widely used in the vedic literature and parashar muni defines bhagwan in a particular way it is not that every usage of the word bhagwan is according to that particular definition so bhagwan as a possessor of six opulences that particular analytical framework then is of is we often use it to establish the divinity of god the unique position of the supreme lord at this and that's wonderful you know who can claim to be possessing all beauty or all knowledge no one except the omnipotent divine at the same time this is just one frame why should god only have six qualities six opulences 
no, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that his opulences are unlimited. Therefore, Eshatu Deshataha Prokto. Therefore, I am speaking just a fragment. So the point I'm making is any analytical framework we use will always fall short of describing the Lord's glories. But still, the analytical framework can give us some understanding of how great the Lord is. In general, that is how we understand things. By placing them in a broader context. Say for example, if we say, Govardhan Eko village is surrounded by a big mountain. Okay, how big is the mountain? It's big. Okay, you know, that might seem like a child's description. Okay, it's big. But okay, is it, it is the second biggest mountain in Maharashtra. Mountain range in Maharashtra. Oh, okay. That seems significant. It is the fifth biggest in India. Okay, that's significant. So generally, now this is, the point of this is not just comparison. The point is placing it in a broader, broader spectrum. But that alone doesn't describe the mountain range because maybe there are some special, special flora and fauna here, there are some special minerals here. And of course it's special because Gordon Eco Village is here. So we could say that there are different, no analytical framework will describe it completely. But every analytical framework helps us to understand. So let's begin. So this is from the Chaitanya Charitam Madhya Leela 900. Hmm. Would anyone like to recite the verse? Arjunir kahit chena hit upadesha tahar dekhe hai mora ananda avesha. Arjun, yeah, thank you. So ar, this is Arjunir kahit chena. So this is actually Mahaprabhu in South India. And while he's in South India, his travels through various places are being described. Actually, the sixth chapter of the Madhya Leela is Mahaprabhu arriving in Puri. The first five chapters of the Madhya describe more or less his post-sanyas travels. He goes to Shantipur, then he comes to uh, <coughs> Ramuna and then to Sakshi Gopal's temple and on the way. And then finally he reaches Orissa, which is Jagannath Puri. And then he decides to start traveling. So seventh chapter and ninth chapter to some extent describe his travels. And eighth chapter describes his conversation with Ramanandrai. So here he is in South India, specifically in Shirangam. And here he's encountering a Brahmana. And this Brahmana is ecstatic while reciting the Bhagavad Gita. Now it's interesting that the Bhagavad Gita itself does not find as much mention in the Chaitanya Charitamrat or in the early Gaudiya literature as the Bhagavatam. The the Chaitanya Charitamrita quotes the Bhagavatam almost 10 times more than it quotes the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. And Chaitanya Bhagavat practically never, hardly ever quotes the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. So, the Bhagavad Gita is not considered that central in terms of the Bhakti tradition. It is important. But how it is? The Bhagavad Gita in one sense is answering Arjuna's question, Pruchami Tvam Dharma Sammudha Chetaha that Arjuna is not sure what is the right thing to do. The dharma here means what is the right thing to do. And he answers that question, what is the right thing to do? So, that right thing to do is answered in terms of sadhan and sadhya. So, what should I do? If I want to know, okay, what do you want to do? Or what is worth doing? And how do you go about doing sadhan and sadhya? So, the sadhan is described to be bhakti and sadhya is described to be bhagavan. So, the, so, in one sense, for the bhakti tradition, the sadhan is already known. So, a book that establishes the sadhan is not that important. It is definitely important in the broad Vedic canon, no doubt. But, it's like somebody who already knows the path. Uh, say, if some, we are coming from Mumbai to GV. Somebody already knows the path, for them, the map is not that important. So like that for the Bhakti tradition, at least initially, the Bhagavad Gita was not that important. So, of course, later, as Bhakti itself became, the Bhakti tradition expanded itself and started having greater social influence, then the importance of Bhakti needed to be established. 
and that was done based on the Bhagavad Gita commentaries by Chakravarti Pad and Baldev Vidyabhushan and others. So here, it is interesting that it is not that this particular Brahmana is ecstatic on hearing the Bhagavatam. It's just reciting the Bhagavad Gita. And so he is saying, Arjunera kahite chena hita upadesh. So, now hita upadesh, there is also a book called Hita Upadesh, which is instructions for benefiting others. But that's more of ethics. The Bhagavad Gita is Hita Upadesh in terms of supreme ethics, in terms of spirituality, in terms of bhakti. But he's saying, when I'm hearing these, Tare Dekhi Hai Mora Ananda Avesh. So when I think, when I dwell, when I visualize how my, the Lord is instructing Arjuna on the chariot, taking the humble role of his charioteer, who has transformed into his counsellor, then I feel, become filled with joy, ananda avesh. So avesh is a word used in the Chaitanya Charitamrita frequently to indicate not just overwhelming emotion, but actually overwhelming emotion that often comes because of the infusion of the divine within a person. That means it is described that sometimes after Mahaprabhu departed, Nakula Brahmachari, when you start speaking, the devotees would feel that it is Mahaprabhu is speaking through him. So Mahaprabhu Ravesh was there. And in fact, there is a whole category of divine uh, descent called Shaktya Avesh Avatar. So the word Avesh is significant, Ananda Avesh. So this indicates itself how the Bhakti tradition was spreading and how Mahaprabhu appreciated that. So it's not described here, over here that, Mah, that Mahaprabhu became happy. Rather, this devotee is saying, I became happy. And seeing this, Mahaprabhu became jubilant. So this is the mood of Mahaprabhu, which is what we'll be focusing on here. That Mahaprabhu's joy was not just in tasting ecstasy, in remembering the Lord, but it joy was also in seeing how others were tasting ecstasy in remembering the Lord. So with respect to our topic, which is how Mahaprabhu transformed the course of Indian history. So I'll be talking about it from four different perspectives, broadly speaking. Use the acronym CAPS. So CAPS is like the summit. It's not just uppercase CAPS, but uh, it is the summit. So culturally, attitudinally, philosophically, and socially. And after each of these, I'll pause briefly. We can have some ref questions or reflections and then we can move forward. Now if you look at culturally, what was Mahaprabhu's dist So Mahaprabhu's distinct contribution in terms of culture was that he is often celebrated even in Indian history as the dancing god. That he brought bhakti outdoors. That the idea of glorifying the Lord through song and prayer and hymns is universal. So if you see in the Bhagavatam, the glorification of the Lord is through philosophical discussions. And of course, devotional narrations of the Lord past, Lord's pastimes. If you see before that in the Bhagavad Gita, in one sense, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam and the Chaitan Charitamrit are all talking about bhakti. At the same time, in the Bhagavad Gita, we could say the bhakti that is taught is significantly unemotional. More and more, the emphasis on Sukhe Dukhe Samay Krutva, Mana Apamana Yotulyas. So, the focus is don't get carried away by emotions. Mm. That is the focus. So there is, there is no description in the Bhagavad Gita of any overpowering ecstasy. It is not that Arjuna on hearing the Bhagavad Gita becomes ecstatic in the sense of Mahaprabhu and starts dancing on the chariot. There is no description of that. Now why is that? See, Bhakti as a, as a principle is universal. Bhakti ultimately means the aspiration of the human heart for union with the divine heart. 
the aspiration of the human heart for union with the divine heart is the essential and universal aspect of bhakti. So the principle of bhakti is universal. The practice of bhakti is variable. How that aspiration will manifest in different places will vary. So if we consider the Bhagavad Gita's context, it was Arjuna's emotions that was coming in the way of his service. He had become overwhelmed by emotions on seeing the opponents. Bhishma Drona Pramukhtaha. So, Sarvesham Chivahikshitam. So, what happened is seeing all of them, especially seeing Bhishma and Drona, he became overwhelmed. Krupaya Paravyavishtam. Overwhelmed by emotion. So, Krishna, in that sense, for helping Arjuna to do his service of fighting, focuses on regulation of emotion, on not giving in to emotion. Then if we move onwards to the Bhagavatam, the Bhagavatam's focus is on helping Shukadev Goswami, helping Parikshit Maharaj, through the words of Shukadev Goswami, to remember the Lord at the time of death. So overall, the Bhagavatam's mood is extremely sober. Death is coming. So if you consider two conversations in the Bhagavatam, death is coming for Parishit Maharaj and Kaliyuga is coming for the sages, sages of Nemisharanya. And both are ominous events. Death is the end of the physical body and Kaliyuga is, uh, is to some extent the decline, if not the destruction of many major aspects of spiritual culture. So it's a very sober event and in appropriate, in appropriate sync with that sober mood, the focus in Bhagavatam is largely on death narratives. That almost every story of the Bhagavatam is, in one sense it culminates in the death of the character. Not all, but many of them. Dhruva goes back to God. It's not just death, it's a glorious disappearance. But if you see the stories culminate in death. It's Dhruva, whether it's Ajamila or whether it's Vratrasura or whether it's even Prithu Maharaj. So it just talks, does talk about the disappearance from the world. Uh, and then ultimately, even Krishna's disappearance, which is often not mentioned so much in the other Puranas, which is not discussed so much in the, even in the Bhakti tradition generally, because the focus is on the death-centered narrative. So that brings sobriety. See, if some Vaishnava is dying, even when we do Kirtans, at that time the Kirtans will be sober. It's not that the Kirtans we will do which will, everybody will want to dance in ecstasy. Yes, there is, a, there is a deep devotional emotion, but it has to be apt according to the context. So, these, uh, this was the Bhakti tradition. And even if you consider Ramanacharya and Madhvacharya, when they taught Bhakti, the, their definition of Bhakti, each Acharya has given their own definition of Bhakti also. So the focus was, Madhacharya, for example, talks about bhakti as remembrance with knowledge. I am simplifying. There is an elaborate exposition of what he means by bhakti. But he, he talks about it as remembrance with knowledge. Ramanujara talks about absorption in meditation. He defines bhakti differently. Again, I, these are very oversimplified. But each tradition's definition of bhakti is reflective of the ethos at that time. Because again, like I told Bhagawan, like the Lord outgrows every frame that we can use to understand Him. Similarly, Bhakti is actually a profound emotion. In fact, Bhakti is the most profound emotion that the human heart is capable of. And even, we could say, lesser emotions are very difficult to define. Now, if you want to define even love in ordinary terms, how do we define it? You know, the, the, say, love can refer to a romantic love, it can refer to a parent's love for a child, it can love for a person, it can refer to a person's love for a con the country, it can refer to so many things. So even ordinary def emotions are difficult to define. Hmm? So then what to speak of the supreme emotion that the human heart is capable of experiencing. So when bhakti is defined by a particular tradition, that tells us not just about what bhakti is, 
but also how bhakti is seen by that tradition. And I will come to that again when we talk about philosophy, that we, <clears throat> how, how does our tradition define bhakti? Rupa Goswami, how does it define bhakti? Anya bilashita shunyam jnana karmadya navrutam anukulyena krishnanu shilanam bhakti ruttama. So this entire definition is very important. I mean, every aspect of it is important. But especially in our tradition, bhakti was considered to be anushilanam. It is to be cultivated. And I'll talk about that later. But the point was that bhakti was expressed in different ways in the, Gaudi, in the Indian tradition. And uh, before Mahaprabhu, the idea of glorifying the Lord was there. But even in India, if you go to different temples, so there are some temples when the arti is done, the, the pujari is doing the arti and maybe there is one person playing musical instruments. But sometimes some people don't even do any verbal kirtan. Mm -hmm. And in some other places we will see that, okay, the pujari is doing kirtan and then there is one person who is singing. And everybody observes. So their vision is that you focus on the vision. And the sound is for the glorification of the Lord. So we don't, so in that sense, that kirtan is more of performance than participation. It is that one particular devotee who is doing the kirtan is performing and others are observing, they are not participating. So bhakti itself, even in the form of worshipping the Lord at the time of the arti, has variable expressions. So now when Mahaprabhu, he appeared, we know the trajectory of his life, initially he appeared to be like a very intellectual person. He was always, of course, intellectual. But his initial focus was on establishing how glorious he was intellectually. And he became a pandit, such a great pandit that, that he started his own school at the age of 14. Now, this is remarkable. There are cases of, of you know, sometimes students completing graduation way before their their particular age but uh, you know so the sometimes a person may even complete their phd normally people complete their phd 23 24 25 somebody may complete it in their teens 17 18 so as far as i have read 16 is the earliest age that anybody has completed a phd but here it's not just complete a phd you complete a phd and then you start your own university start your own college start your own institute so Mahaprabhu was like that. He started that. And after that, he said that, especially he met Ishwar Puri and he said, I cannot teach this anymore. He started seeing everything in terms of Krishna. Now it's significant here also that he did not tell his students that grammar is useless. That was not his thrust. Because in one sense, grammar also has to be learned for continuing the Sanskrit tradition. But he said, I cannot do it. And what happened was, his students had become so attached to the teacher that the subject didn't matter. Okay, then what are you going to teach? That's what we want to learn. So, that is uh, Mahaprabhu's attractiveness that he manifested. And then he started manifesting bhakti. But even when he manifested bhakti, initially when he was doing kirtans indoors. And then there was the uh, threat for the kirtans. So there, was a, there is a circumstantial reason why Mahaprabhu brought the kirtan outdoors and there is a transcendental reason. So circumstantial, uh, but either way, I will come to both of them, but either way what happened was that Mahaprabhu started kirtan and kirtan itself was there talked about in the scriptures and done in the tradition. But the idea of going out and doing kirtans was something which Mahaprabhu did for the first time. And that actually revolutionized the way bhakti is practiced. So, one of the characteristics of bhakti that is described in the Bhagavatam is that it is a pratihata. Savai pumsam paro dharmo yato bhakti radhokshaje. 
yayatma suprasidati so now vishla prabhupad explains this that we should practice bhakti in a way that is uninterrupted that we should be not motivated materially ahituki and then we will be able to practice also in an interrupted way so if somebody thinks my practice of bhakti is meant to give me material security i will every day chant the holy names and then god will ensure that my health is good my family is good my job is good if they think that then what are they doing basically they are actually reducing bhakti into like a back door entry into the house of materialism there's a front door entry which is karma kand just pray to god make everything is wonderful for me but i don't pray to god but still i expect that so karma kand is like the front front door entry into materialism and this kind of bhakti with the expectation of material well being is like a back door entry so back door entry means the world doesn't know you have come in but still you have come in there so it's like that so prabhupad said we practice bhakti ahaituki unmotivated and if it is not motivated by anything material then it will not be interrupted by anything material hmm? if i am practicing bhakti with the expectation that okay my everything about my material life should be good then if that is not good then naturally the question will come why should i practice bhakti but if you are practicing bhakti primarily to connect with the lord then that connection can be made in any situation we may be materially wealthy or materially not so wealthy but we can still glorify the lord we can still chant his holy names so apratihata prabhupad focuses on the fact that bhakti should be practiced in an uninterrupted way by us now vishwanath chakra thakur in his commentary in the bhagavatam focuses not on the sadhaka but on the sadhana itself he says that these two character this character is ahituki and pratihata is characteristic of bhakti itself not of bhakta now of course it can apply to both what does that mean that means that he says that bhakti cannot be interrupted by anything material and that was what was demonstrated in a very big way during the medieval times if you see the broad indian history the bhagavatam was spoken thousands of years ago and if the bhagavatam disc- talks about bhakti very directly but at the same time when all the sages are assembled to give guidance to parikshit maharaj none of them is very clear what to do and then sukhdev goswami comes and he says that that the smad bharat sarvatma essentially he says that bhagwan ishvaro hari that hear about him shotavya kirtitavya cha dheya pujya chintida that hear remember worship glorify that lord so it's centered on bhakti but the bhagavatam itself says that muktanam api siddhanam narayana parayana sudarlava prasantat pashantatma kotishu api mahamune that even among great sages those who are total devoted to narayana are relatively rare so bhaktas have always been rare what krishna says in the bhagavad gita manushyanam sahasreshu kashchid iti siddhaye that yatatam visiddhanam kashchin maam vet tatvatah among thousands few aspire for spiritual truth and among those who aspire for spiritual truth few actually come to know me so bhakti has always been that way rare although the scripture tells it is it is the highest it is not something which was even in the past very widespread it was piety was very widespread everybody was pious but pure devotion was not now what happened in the medieval times was so so in the if you see in the bhagavatam the ramayan the mahabharat there's a lot of emphasis on fire sacrifices if you will see that's what is described the parikshit maharaj sorry uh, yudhishthira maharaj performs yagya and so many other people do those kind of sacrifices that's fire sacrifices but now as times change especially from the 11th century onwards in india there was the uh, gradual incursion of the islamic invaders and in many ways they were quite intolerant not all of them were equally intolerant but many of them were so currently in india there is a 
national shock and outrage that has come up because of this uh, movie, The Kashmir Files, which you described in very shocking detail, um, the, the pogrom, the genocide of the Kashmiri Hindus. So that has become very awake in Indian consciousness. Uh, at the same time, it is not something which is new. The Kashmiri Pandits himself, Kashmiri Hindus themselves, they have survived six genocides before this. And they continued to stay in Kashmir in spite of that. But this genocide forced them to live. But this is something which has happened throughout human Indian history. So in, in, throughout means in, at least in the medieval times. Now what happened is that uh, initially the Muslims just tried to, when they invaded, they just tried to convert everyone. If you, if you look at Indian history, uh, or world history, there was the Mesopotamian civilization, which was there in the Middle East. But that was completely eradicated. Because that was, that's what happened because of uh, the Islamic takeover. But in India, when they came, the people were too many, and the culture was too deep-rooted. So they, they just couldn't convert everyone. And eventually, there was some kind of uneasy calm that was restored. The uneasy calm was that, okay, we will, we will rule, and you practice what you want to practice, but you do it privately. You do it privately. And now, in one sense, the bhakti tradition is actually very resilient. So I talk about resilience and resurgence. See, resilience means what? That even if something is crushed, it does not stay crushed. If I take a glass paper weight and throw it down, it'll just crack into pieces. But if you take a rubber ball and throw it down, the rubber ball will bounce back. So there are many, many religious practices which depend on a lot of externals. And if those externals are not available, then they can't be practiced. We can't be practiced at all. So, so they are like the glass paper weight. You destroy the external support. What do people do? But bhakti is like that rubber ball. You throw it down, it'll bounce back. So in one sense, as I said, bhakti is simply the expression of the human heart's longing for union with the divine heart. And that can be practiced in any way. So in general, what happened was, as the Islamic takeover of India started becoming more widespread, uh, the broad Vedic tradition, broad practice of dharma started shifting towards bhakti. And not only that, the bhakti started becoming more you could say private, in the homes. Uh, so, that it's paradoxical in that sense that when India was quite Vedic, at that time, Punya was there, but Bhakti was not there. When India became less Vedic, in the sense at least the rulers were not followers of Sanatan Dharma, at that time, Bhakti became more prominent. So, Bhakti became more widespread, because that was the only practice that was accessible. So there is the resil resilience of the bhakti tradition that it cannot be suppressed by anything external. That is apratihata. Even in the modern times, if we see that when Soviet Russia was uh, existing, they had a very strong antipathy towards religion of all sorts. And uh, that's why... All religions were persecuted. There was one person who was the the founders who led to the various revolutions, including the communist revolution. He said his ideology, which is adopted by the communists, he said that society will no longer society will not know peace till the last aristocrat is choked with the intestines of the last priest. So, that was his actually teaching. So that means basically, the last Kshatriya, the aristocrat is, well, it's not exactly Kshatriya, but basically ruler, was killed and choked with the intestines of the last Brahmana. That was the kind of antipathy that was there. So, it is devotees continued practice bhakti, even in Soviet Russia, in spite of all difficulties. And then there was a big... As there's resilience of the bhakti tradition, and then there was a resurgence. After Soviet Russia fell, then devotees are practicing bhakti so much more in Russia and Ukraine. 
at the places where outside India, apart from India, the bhakti, bhakti tradition is most widespread in terms of people following it. Of course, presently with the war between Russia and Ukraine, there are challenges, but the devotees are still practicing and even distributing prasad and offering relief to those who are afflicted by this whole disaster. So, but the point I was making is the bhakti tradition is resilient, bhakti is, has resilience and there's resurgence. So resilience means what? It survives even amid the adversities. And resurgence means not just it survives, but it thrives. So what Mahaprabhu did was that there is a phase of resilience which was in the, er the early Islamic invaders, they were quite barbaric. Then after that, apart from Aurangzeb, the other invaders were not that barbaric. Not that they were, they were any symbols of tolerance, but that they were just not that barbaric. So what happened is that Mahaprabhu did this resurgence of bhakti. Now of course Madhacharya, Ramanacharya, and before him Shankaracharya, Shankaracharya of course came much earlier. And even Madhva, Ramanacharya came before actually the Islamic invasion started spreading. They had traveled across the world, across India, and they had talked about the glory of bhakti to everyone. But they had not talked about public harina. Well, Mahaprabhu did that. And when did he do that? When this, the Islamic rulers of those times, what they did was, they came and they broke the, the Brudanga. And they said that if anybody performs Kirtan, we will, you will be punished, you may be killed, you will be arrested. So, now what was Mahaprabhu's response? Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in his book on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, phrased it as the first civil disobedience movement. So, what he did was, Mahaprabhu led Harinam Sankirtan. And it was a, such a large number of people. It seemed not just all of Navadweep, but everybody from the earth had come there. Such was the number of people. And when the Kazi saw this, he saw, it's like you see people, Sometimes you see, you see people, okay, the whole room is full. That's impressive. But then you say, okay, the whole premises are full. Okay, that's even more impressive. But it, sometimes you see, there are human beings as far as the eye can see. Oh, it's just like an ocean of humanity everywhere. He was completely alarmed. What happened? Where did all these people come from? And all, it was such a gigantic show of strength. That, that person who, who considered himself an autocrat, who could do anything, he just fled and hid in his house. And then, then actually when Mahaprabhu met him, Mahaprabhu was very respectful. You know, he said, you are the host of this house, I have come as a guest to meet you. And why are you not coming to receive me? He says, he says you came in a very unusual way. So, they had a sweet interaction over there. But the point is that Mahaprabhu, in one sense, got the permission at that time uh, to start public harina. So, now of course, in these instances, in this particular instance, we can say that there is, there was supernatural intervention. Supernatural intervention was sheer, the sheer number of people were so many. And before that, the Kazi said that he had, he had a dream in which Narasimha Dev had come, or he didn't recognize it as Narasimha Dev, but he realized that a fearsome lion had come. And that also sobered him, that also scared him a little bit. So there are many, if we go across many temples in India, there are supernatural tales of how that particular deity was protected or how that particular deity acted in the mud. Not that the deity was protected, but the deity also protected both ways. Now th these supernatural tales have happened. At the same time, the supernatural intervention by the Lord doesn't happen always. In fact, we can say that is more of an exception than the norm. Hmm. And bhakti is, as we discussed earlier, it's not so much about physical protection as about spiritual liberation. That sometimes the greatest spiritual liberation, the greatest spiritual connection with the Lord is experienced when there is adversity at the material level, when there is restriction at the material level. When there is deprivation at the material level. 
I was just talking on phone with one devotee friend from Ukraine. So he had to flee from Ukraine and he's now finally reached Poland. So he said that I and my family were discussing, we have never chanted Hare Krishna as attentively as we were on this, while we were on the trip. <laughs> we were on the trip going from Ukraine to Poland. At that time, we, we prayed so deeply. Now, that doesn't mean that that is the only time we can pray or that doesn't mean that every time there's adversity, naturally we will pray. It just means that bhakti is, as I said, resilient and resurgent. Bhakti can manifest even in adversities. So there was no supernatural intervention in their case. And sometimes there is protection at the material level, sometimes there is no protection at the material level. But in one sense, to practice bhakti is to learn to see beyond the material. Not to not see the material, because we can't, we have eyes and we can't function with closed eyes. So we will see the material. But bhakti means to be able to see beyond the material also. And uh, so, so, that, so sometimes there will be supernatural intervention by the Lord, which will be manifested at the material level. And sometimes there will be no supernatural intervention. And sometimes because of that adversity, there may be destruction at the material level also. But the point is that bhakti goes on. And Mahaprabhu started this. See, again, Mahaprabhu did not emphasize building of any big temples in Mayapur. And of course, there was worship of the Lord and there were Shaligram Shilas or small temple deities. But Mahaprabhu did not emphasize building of temples in Vrinda, in Mayapur rather. Because that was not suitable at those times. So, just like Kunti Maharani says, Gange Gamudanvati. The Ganga flows toward the ocean and it finds its way. Sometimes left, sometimes right, sometimes above, below, sometimes below. It finds its way. So like that, the bhakti that comes from the human heart finds its way to reach the divine heart. But Mahaprabhu was a person who actually started this public harinam. And then how much it is to be done in public and when, there may be some variation about that. Mahaprabhu wanted to sing and dance even in the boat as a threat that the boat might capsize. There's an immediate threat that the boat might overturn because of Mahaprabhu's ecstatic dancing and there's also the circumstantial further threat that okay there will be, it might attract thieves or that might attract the rulers over there Mahaprabhu kept dancing but then when his associates became very agitated Mahaprabhu stopped it so the expression of bhakti publicly may vary according to time place circumstance but this aspect of making bhakti public that was what has actually made bhakti much more widespread and also much more accessible. Now, now Srila Prabhupada, in one sense, went to America. Prabhupada's godbrothers, when he went to, went to uh, UK, they met some elite people and they had some photo ops with them. But they didn't do any public harina. Now, Prabhupada, what he did was, he went to... Tompkins Square Park and other places and he did, did Harinam and that's what attracted people. And then not just sitting at one place and doing Harinam but also going out on Harinam. So the idea is that take Bhakti out to people. So that's what the Kirtan does. Harinam Sankirtan in public, what is that? And that is actually the primary legacy of Mahaprabhu. And today if you know, there are uh, there are often, as India is rising in the world, what has happened is, in the past, India was considered to be a part of the, like, the global south, the, that which was exploited by the north, the, the colonial uh, west or the north, that was exploited and India was a part of that. But India is rising now. India is also becoming a political and economic powerhouse. So the idea is, more and more people want to know about India. So there are surveys done, what are the prominent, what is the prominent vision of India when people are asked, you know, people in the West? So in the past it was, oh, Indians means snake charmers and things like that. But it's interesting that when people were asked, it was just two, three years ago, when you think about India and Indians, what do you think about? So one was, of course, software engineers. That is quite to be expected. But, but another thing which they said is, Ratyatra and dancing people. People dancing on the streets singing happily. So, 
it's significant that this has become a part of the mainstream cultural perception of India. And what does India mean? India means that there is this wonderful festival. People go on the streets and dance and sing. So in fact, there are some Christian groups in South India which have, Christians adopt everything that the Hindus do and center it on Jesus. So they have, just like the Vishnu Sahasranam, they have Jesus Sahasranam. So, so they have created this. So they have adopted the Harinam Sankirtan and they try to do something which is, which they call as Christ Nam Sankirtan. <laughs> now it doesn't have any, any followers as much as anywhere as Harinam has, but it just indicates how widespread this has become. So, Mahaprabhu, so now and by Mahaprabhu's mercy, it will become further. So when we said that how Mahaprabhu changed the course of Indian history, that is not an exaggeration. That is a reflection at least of the trajectory that events have taken. So any reflections or questions at this point? So I'm taking the acronym CAPS. So I just discussed till now the first one, C was how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu transformed the course of Indian history culturally. Any questions or reflections at this point? So let's look at the second part. So A is attitudinally. So attitudinally means that we have this Mahaprabhu meeting the, the Brahmana in the Kurma Desh and he says, Jare dekho, tare kaho, Krishna Upadesh. That whoever you meet, speak about Krishna. Amara agya hai, taro e desh. In this way, you deliver your country. Now it's interesting, Now I, I won't say that I have read about other traditions so much. Now all the Acharyas have talked about practicing bhakti and sharing bhakti. But such a direct call of action to every follower, hmm, I haven't seen that in the writings of Madhvacharya or Ramanacharya. It may be there, I'm not saying I'm not, but it is not seen and it's definitely not prominent. In fact, I was talking with one prominent uh, Shri Vaishnava scholar and I asked him that you know, there is so much conversion happening uh, why doesn't the Shri Vaishnava tradition do much about it? So says yes there are, there are of course some leaders who do who are concerned who are reaching out to people but he says their understanding is that no sorry this was a Madhva, Madhva scholar not a Shri Vaishnava scholar Madhva, Madhva scholars sometimes tend to be a little Madhva tradition has been a little bit not to it's been a little elitist that you know we are special so they said that this is their understanding is actually spiritual growth is a multi-lifetime process. So when somebody is actually qualified to become Madhava Vaishnava, they will be born in Madhava Vaishnava family. Till that time they are simply progressing through multiple lifetimes. Whether they are Hindus or Christians doesn't matter. Well, that's not a, first of all it's not a very, we could say a compassionate way of looking at it. And I'm in no way saying that this is the view of the entire Madhva tradition. This was one particular scholar's, Madhva scholar's understanding of why they are not so interested in proselytizing. And again, this is not to say that everybody in the Madhva tradition like that. There are Pejavar Swami and others who did reach out to a large number of people beyond even the normal caste barriers. But the point is, this was often the idea that, yeah, people are evolving over multiple, multiple lifetimes and when they are qualified, they will come to our path. Till then, they can just go on. So, the idea that we should go out and not just the leaders, See, every tradition has its leaders who will, who will establish this tradition, propagate that tradition, and that's important. The, the, the leaders are, largely the growth of a tradition depends on the charisma, the spiritual potency of the leaders. In many ways, both Buddha and Shankara Acharya, they spread, uh, their teachings spread primarily based on their personal charisma and potency. If you look at the teachings of Buddha, his teachings at one level can seem remarkably evasive. Evasive in the sense that he doesn't talk about philosophy so much. He just, he just dodges philosophical questions and focuses more on, more, on, uh, more on practical ethics, we can say. And that's what sometimes appeals to people. And Shankaracharya also, he's written a lot of philosophy, but if we actually read the Sharika Bhashya, there are clear, uh, we could say, holes in logic, which subsequent 
commentators have tried to fill. But the point is that it was more, not so much the logic of their presentations or in the scriptural basis of their presentations as the personal potency. They were charismatic people. So the idea that every follower should take up the mantle and share it. This in the Indian tradition, Mahaprabhu did for the first time. Jare dekho, tare kaho Krishna Upadesh. It is not just you who should do, but not just every follower, but every follower should try to share it with others. Now there are some people who say that this kind of missionary, uh, missionary work, that is not the mood of the Indian tradition at all. The, in, in, the Hindu tradition was never a missionary tradition. We practice, we don't try to convert others. The word convert has a negative connotation, strongly negative connotation. So once uh, as a part of the uh, as part of Back to Godhead team, we had decided to make a whole issue on Christianity. And we were going to talk about, we wrote our article about conversions. And then we talked about how the conversions are disrupting the cultural fabric, cultural, cultural and social fabric of the of, of of, Indi of the Indian community, villages, towns. So when I sent uh, that article to the international BTG editors, so one of the editors commented, you know, the kind of arguments you are making, these are the exact kind of arguments my parents made when I wanted to practice bhakti. <laughs> that means, you know, we have our own culture, we have our own society. When you are practicing, you are taking up this foreign tradition, you are disrupting. You are disrupting what we are doing. So, for many people, they think that what we are doing, we, what we are, the, the, the preaching work that we are doing, that is actually, uh, it is not Vedic, it is more Abrahamic, it is more that kind of evangelical tradition is not there within the Vedic idea. So that's why it is to focus on, in Bhakti there is a transcendental aspect and there is a circumstantial or contextual aspect. So this was that Jara Dekho Tare Kaho Krishna Upadesh. This is a principle that Mahaprabhu taught and, it, and Prabhupada also did that. And Prabhupada, in one sense, if you read Prabhupada's books, everyone who reads Prabhupada's books will see, will feel that Prabhupada is calling us to share Krishna Bhakti. Hmm. And I was reading some Vyas Puja offerings recently of Sri Prabhupada and as one Vyas Puja offering by Satsuru Maharaj, he says, Prabhupada, he says that that sharing Krishna Bhakti uh, is your standing instruction to every one of your followers. It's a standing instruction. So Prabhupada carried on that mood. So now why, why is that? So evangelism, we could say, in one sense. Yes, is it Vedic? Well, we have to understand what is Vedic. See, there is the form and there is the mood. In the broad Vedic tradition, there was no organized attempt to convert one person to another religion. Mm -hmm. Drupada was a shy white. The Pandavas were Vaishnavites. And still they got married. And Draupadi was, she was born in a shy white family. She was a few Lord Shiva, that we know that story, how she got those five husbands, or she was seeking in a previous life. And she got five husbands thereby. But she was a great devotee of Krishna. And she called out to Krishna. She didn't call out to Shiva at that time when she was in danger. So the idea was that at one level, one's faith was one's private affair. And that did not come in the way of social interactions. At the same time, everybody was having faith and devotion. The expressions might be different. But what happened is that the, the Vedic tradition is, yes, there is an understanding, there is organic growth. Everybody is on the spiritual journey at different places and everybody takes steps forward on that path. But when India was overrun by the Abrahamic religions, the Abrahamic religions are broadly Judaism, Christianity and Islam and they all accept Abraham as one of their prophets. So that's why they are called as Abrahamic religions. So they have a focus on evangelism. Judaism doesn't have it so much but Christianity and Islam do have it a lot. So Islam doesn't use the word evangelism specifically. That's used associated more with Christianity. But they have the idea that we should go and convert everyone else. In fact, one of Jesus' quotes is that, make disciples all over the world. 
Now they use the disciples. It's interesting in the Christian tradition, they have the word disciple without the corresponding word guru. <laughs> so when they use the word disciple, it is focused more on discipline, not on the trainer of the discipline. So when they say dis make disciples all over the world, what it means is that you get people to accept Jesus as your savior. So that evangelical aspect is very much there within Christianity. So what happened was, and as I said, the, even the Islamic tradition was to some extent about converting people. Mm -hmm. Now what happened was the Islamic tradition was never, for, within the Indian history, was never an intellectual competitor to the Vedic tradition. It, it was a political comp competitor and to some extent it was, a, it was a political conqueror also. But it was never much of an intellectual competitor. That doesn't mean that there is not intellectual depth in the uh, Islamic tradition also. It is there to some extent. In fact, before the European Renaissance, what called and scientific revolution that happened in Europe, there's a lot of intellectual achievements in the Islamic tradition also in the Middle East. Uh, but all that got uh, lost over time. That's a complex history. But at least the invaders who came to India, the Islamic invaders, they were in no way the intellectual torch bearers of Islam. So Islam was never an intellectual competitor to the Vedic tradition. But still there was the constant attempt to use whether it was the Jazia tax where those who were not Muslims were taxed extra and many other ways that there was the pressure to conform and convert. So it was a response to that. If there is a thorn in the leg, then you take another thorn to get the thorn out of the, out of the foot. So the emphasis on sharing is something which Mahaprabhu was quite, uh, we could say, quite distinctive about. Now we may say, doesn't Krishna talk about it also? Krishna says that those who share this message all over the world are most dear to me. Yes, Krishna does say that. So it's interesting how Krishna does it is. There are almost opposing verses. In 1868 and 69, he talks about Yaidam Param Bhakti Bhakti Tasman Anya He says those who practice bhakti will become purified, they will attain me and they will become most dear to me. The, sorry, those who share bhakti. But just the previous verse is saying that Idam Tena Tapaskayana Bhaktaya Kadachana Nachashu Shru Shavacham Nacha Maam Yobhisuyati. That don't share this with those who are not austere, those who are not devoted, those who are not, those who don't have a service attitude. And certainly don't share this with those who are non-devotional. So what is going on in these two verses? See the idea is, Krishna is saying definitely share it. But share it according to the adhikar of people. According to the adhikar of people. Whatever is the quali qualification of people, according to that you share it. So when he's saying that this knowledge don't share with those who are not devoted. What is he? This is 1867 and 1867 comes just after 1866. What is 1866? The famous verse. Sarva dharman prithyaja maame kam sharanam raja aham maham tom sarpape bhyo moksha ishami maashu chaha. So what it means is Krishna is saying that this is his declaration of love for Arjun. No, you just do what I'm telling you to do and if you do it, I will, even if you get into any trouble because of this, even if there are some sinful reactions, I will protect you from those sinful reactions. But then Krishna says, don't tell this to everyone. Why is that? Because say, let's take a contemporary metaphor, if there is a parent and there is a child. Hmm? So what happens is, say the parent uh, so the father is father is maybe a king or a very landlord, well, maybe a king, and then they have one son who is very responsible, and that father wants that son to go on a very difficult but essential assignment, and then the father says that you know no matter what happens, I'll rescue you. If you get into trouble, I will get you out of the trouble, no matter what happens. Now this is the, expression, is the expression of the father's love as well as 
the fathers you could say loving call that you do this you take up this task you do this assignment as so for arjun it is fighting against bhishma and drona it is shooting arrows at one's guru and one's elders is unheard of in one sense so krishna is saying arjun you do this don't hesitate i'll protect you it is a difficult assignment but when this father is telling this the whatever trouble you get into i will get you out of that trouble then the father may say you know you have that irresponsible brother you know is always spending money and doing nothing good don't tell this promise to him <laughs> you know not that you get into any trouble i'll get you out of it no then what will you he will waste money he will gamble he will do all kinds of things and then he expect me to bail him out i'm not going to do that to him so this declaration is the father's love for a child who is responsible who is doing something difficult now does that mean that the father doesn't love the other children loves everyone and even if those children get into trouble the father will bail will try to bail them out but the child the children should not use that assurance to get into trouble intentionally hmm? for their own self indulgent pleasure so that's why what krishna is saying at one level this particular instruction that that this guhyatama gyan the most confidential knowledge krishna says don't tell this to everyone so then after that he says that yes those who are devo- those who are devotional doesn't mean those who are practicing the bhakti necessarily but even those who are devotionally minded those who are devotionally inclined share it with them so the idea is adhikar adhikar means what is the qualification what is the attitude with which a person is practicing so in the vedic tradition the idea is that spiritual knowledge is given according to the adhikar of people but what is mahaprabhu's mercy is patra patra na dekhi na dekhi sthan sthan that he doesn't look at the qualification he doesn't look at the situation he just gives his mercy to everyone so this is extraordinary in terms of the attitude what mahaprabhu embodied was that he just went about sharing krishna bhakti with everyone it was he would when he was doing harina you know he was going so ecstatic that he would hug people and those people would become permeated with ecstasy and then they would go and touch people and those people would become electrified with ecstasy so it was is mahaprabhu was almost like transmitting devotional energy which was just going from person to person to person so the idea was that spread it to everyone share it with everyone and uh, then when mahaprabhu said that prithvi te achit nagar adi gram sarvatra prachar hoi ve mor naam that in every town and village of the world this whole the holy name will be chanted that was such a remarkable prophecy at those times if you see at best for most of the history of gaudiya vaishnavism gaudiya vaishnavism is not much more than a uh, one religious sect within bengal and orissa that it would spread all over the world that was something which is very difficult to even conceive but mahaprabhu predicted that and mahaprabhu intended that so he was a person who went who traveled far and wide and he inspired everyone to do harinam and in this way again we don't want to compare acharyas for minimizing any particular acharya every acharya has the mission that the lord inspired them to do and they do that and we see that whether it's ramacharya or madhvacharya they also at times reached across caste barriers and they also reached out to people even from lower castes or outcasts they reached out to everyone at the same time there is no description in their travels of they inspiring mass sankirtan yes they sometimes they encountered um, it could be hunters or uh, savage tribals and they transformed them also but in general they uh, they went and they talked with scholars and they were tremendously successful in in transforming those scholars understandings of the nature of the ultimate reality but as far as mahaprabhu was concerned he also did that he did transform scholars like prakash anand saraswati and sarom bhattacharya uh, at the same time mahaprabhu also did this widespread we could say not just class outreach but also mass outreach and he went to everyone and he went to everyone and inspired them to take up harinam and that's what mahaprabhu's followers did 
So when his, his followers, if we consider the three followers, are, we have Shaman, Pandit, Narutam Das Thakur, and Srivansa Acharya, they would actually go out and they would do, when they were traveling, we know that they transformed Bhirambir, the king, and that became the first Vaishnav kingdom. And that was just one of the histories of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, uh, the historical triumphs. There are many other triumphs like that also. So the idea that we should go out and share Krishna Bhakti, and that is the responsibility of every follower. That is something which Mahaprabhu was quite distinctive. In one sense, we may say that, okay, Mahaprabhu, later on, he didn't travel. He was, for the last uh, almost two decades of his life, he was in Puri. But Mahaprabhu was still doing that. Jare dekho tare kaho Krishna Upadesh. Whoever came to meet him, he spoke about Krishna to them. So the outreach about Krishna can also be at different levels. One is we go out to new people and tell them about Krishna. The other is we inspire and empower those who will go out and tell people about Krishna. So initially, Mahaprabhu was himself traveling and telling people about Krishna. But then he was in Puri where he was meeting his associates. The Goswamis would come to meet him. The first 10 chapters of the Antelila are primarily about various people coming and meeting Mahaprabhu. Whether it is Vallabh Bhatta or whether it is Pradyumna Mishra, whether it is Rupa Goswamis, Sanatan Goswami, Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, even Ramachandra Puri, he didn't accept bhakti, but that is about Mahaprabhu's meeting. So Mahaprabhu is meeting people and these people are being inspired and empowered and they go and share Krishna Bhakti in different ways. So that is a distinctive legacy of Mahaprabhu. So Jare Dekho Tare Kaho Krishna Upadesh. Now this does not literally have to mean that anybody we meet on a train or a flight or an ordinary interaction, we just have to start immediately speaking about Krishna. The idea is the intent has to be to try to raise people's consciousness toward Krishna. Mm -hmm. We can say, what is the difference between material consciousness and spiritual consciousness? Material consciousness means that whenever we see someone, we think, what can this person do for me? And spiritual consciousness means, when we see someone, what can I do for this person? And what can I do for this person is, okay, how can I help this person on their spiritual journey toward Krishna? So, it is, it can, we can speak Krishna's message appropriately according to time, place, circumstance. But that is what Mahaprabhu demonstrates. And if you see, when Mahaprabhu was, Mahaprabhu was in a culture, if you can see broadly speaking, there are three broad demographics that Mahaprabhu interacts with. One is devotees. Devotees are people who become his followers. Uh, or they are at least broadly devotees. So, the second is, he interacts with people who are from the broader Vedic tradition. They may be Advaitins, they may be Vaishnavas of other traditions. And there are people who are outside the tradition. Hmm? Completely. So, we can say Vaishnavas, Vedic followers and non-Vedic people. So, non-Vedic people primarily, there is no... Although there are, there are descriptions of uh, Christians coming to India right in the 3rd century, 2nd, uh, 3rd century itself, but there is no description in any of the 27 biographies of Mahaprabhu, of Mahaprabhu interacting with any followers of Christian, Christianity. So Mahaprabhu's interactions with respect to followers outside the Vedic tradition are primarily, uh, as Bhakti Thakur says in his... Uh, Gauranga Shatanam is that Baudha Jaina Mayavadi Kutarka Khandan. So he says Baudha Jaina Mayavadi Kutarka Khandan. Khandan is refutation. Tarka is logic. Kutarka is false logic. So the false logic of all these people was countered by Mahaprabhu. Kutarka Khandan. So what happened is that he says Mayavadi, of course, we know as I talked about Saru Bhattacharya and Prakashan Saraswati. Now, Baudha, there is that indicate that pastime, which I'll come to briefly. Now, as far as I have read, there is n in Chaitan Charitamu, Chaitan Bhagavad, Chaitan Mangal, I haven't seen any interaction of Mahaprabhu with the Jai, Jains so much. But in some ways, bo 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 Buddhists and Jains are similar. In one, um, what way they the same? You know, they, they are, we could say, both are focused more on morality than on spirituality. They are both, we could say, pre-theistic traditions. Now, 
philosophically some people may say they are atheistic but actually they are not so much atheistic they, they are not so much against God as they are focusing on basic moral practices which can prepare people to eventually become devoted to God so now if you consider so if you talk about these three broad demographics Mahapur interacting with Bhaktas then with broad Vedic tradition followers and non-Vedic tradition not non-Vedic people so how does he interact with them? So with respect to bhaktas, there are two broad ways he does it. See, that is, there are some, if we consider his South India tour itself, there are some bhaktas who, whom he transforms. That means that he, there's this Ram Bhakta who initially is chanting Lord Ram's names, and then he meets Mahaprabhu, and then Mahaprabhu is traveling back. At that time, he sees he's chanting Krishna's names. And what has happened over there is, Mahaprabhu is, actually, he says, what happened? He says, you know, I understood that you are the Supreme Lord. And you are chanting Krishna's names. By your association, I am inspired to chant Krishna's names. And that's wonderful. But on the other side, if you see, what Mahaprabhu also does is, if we consider the Svipra. So with respect to Ramdas Vipra, what happens? He is, he invites Mahaprabhu to come to his place for prasad, but he's so, he's so distracted, he's so distressed, that he doesn't cook anything, he doesn't prepare anything. And Mahaprabhu asks, what happens? He says, you know, I don't feel like doing anything. I'm, I'm just so agony struck, so mortified that, how could the goddess of fortune, Sita, how could she have been, have been touched by a demon like Ravan? And he abducted her. How did this such a thing happen? So, now, we may say that says something which happened thousands of years ago. You know, how are you so afflicted by it that you can't do anything practical right now? But Mahaprabhu appreciates the great devotional uh, emotion, devotional, devotional emotion of, of this Bhakta. And then what he does is, he assures him on his own count. And then later on when he's traveling further and he comes across a Puranic narrative which describes actually how Sita was not abducted. It was a Maya Sita that was abducted. Then Mahaprabhu travels back and tells him that he shows him this. Actually Sita was not abducted. And Sita was always safe with Agni Dev. It was only Maya Sita that was taken around. And he feels completely relieved. And then this time, immediately he cooks prasad for Mahaprabhu and he offers him with great joy and gratitude. But the point is, at the, after that, Mahaprabhu doesn't say, you know, say, I did so much for you. I found the scripture and came back. Now, are you chanting Hare Krishna? He says, why are you chanting Ram's name? Stop chanting Ram's names. Mahaprabhu doesn't do that. He's happy that he's so devoted to Ram and he stays devoted to Ram. So the idea is that those who are on a theistic path, okay. Those who are on a theistic path, Mahaprabhu, <coughs> when we talk about evangelism, there is a difference between, we could say, Vaishnav evangelism and Abrahamic evangelism. That's the point I'm trying to make over here. That within the Abrahamic tradition, the idea is this is the only way. And if you're not following this way, then you are going to go to hell. And there are extremist versions of that which say, you're not only going to go to hell, we'll help you get there faster. <laughs> so, the idea is that this evangelism, even if we say that Mahaprabhu is talking about, the word preaching nowadays has a negative connotation, so we sometimes avoid that word, we use outreach. But the point is, when Mahaprabhu is doing it, there's a very different mood. The essential understanding is very different. We don't consider that anybody who is not following our path is going to go to hell. That is not our understanding. We understand that spiritual growth is a multi-life journey and what we can try to do is accelerate it for you. But if somebody is committed to a particular path, this is going to be late, late let me see, yeah. So if you consider that uh, Mahaprabhu taught this achintya bheda bhed. So, we, so the difference between, we could say, Abrahamic outreach and Vaishnava outreach is that there is a time when to look at bhed and there is a time when to look at abhed. And recognizing that is the art. What does it mean? That we understand that in 
in the Gaudiya Vaishnava path, tomorrow when I talk about Rasa, this, uh, I won't be able to complete this for all four today. I'll talk about the philosophical aspect tomorrow. But we'll, we understand that is our conviction that Mahaprabhu has, Mahaprabhu's mercy had, has made the spiritual journey very easily accessible. And not only very easily accessible, very rapidly transformational. I'll explain what I mean by all this. So that's why we want to share this path with others. But if somebody is not ready to take this path, that doesn't mean that we think that they are going to go to hell. Mama vartama anuvartante manushya partha sarvasha. Krishna says all people are on our path or all people are on my path. That is not, that is a quite different from uh, I am the light and the sun and, and no one shall come to the father except through me. The, that I am, I am the only way. That's a very different understanding. So the idea is this is a faster path to God and that's why you take it up. But if you are, if you are already committed to some other path, then we are not going to demonize you. We are not going to condemn you. So, there is a time to emphasize Bhed and there is a time to emphasize Abhed. So, for some of his followers, like this Rama Bhakta, who became a Krishna Bhakta, Mahaprabhu was happy about that. But the, somebody who was already so devoted to Lord Ram that he, he couldn't eat, he couldn't do anything normal because of his think, absorption in Lord Ram's pastimes. Mahaprabhu had no intent to disrupt him. Absolutely no intent to disrupt him said, yes, you continue on your path. You continue on your path. And so there he appreciated the Abhed. You are also worshipping the same Supreme Lord. You are worshipping the same Supreme Lord and I appreciate you for that. So the idea is, if we consider, even Mahaprabhu met uh, the Kazi. Now, uh, Inish, so we could say Mahaprabhu had come in force. And he had at that time far more followers than what the Kazi could have. The Kazi had some guards and some, uh, some soldiers, but Mahaprabhu had come with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He could have forced him to convert. But, but he didn't do that. The Kazi said that, yeah, what you're saying is true. I appreciate what you're saying, but I have to go along with, uh, with the path of my community. And Mahaprabhu said, no, that's hypocrisy. If you are going to go along with if you are going to go along, if you believe one thing and you practice another thing, that's hypocrisy. Mahaprabhu said, no, if that's what is required, you do that. But incorporate. You know, he said that, so you allow Krishna, you allow the devotees to perform some kirtan. He says, yes, of course I'll allow that. Nobody will oppose you. So the idea is that there are times when, even when there may be very different faiths, we need to know when to focus on bhed and when to focus on abhed. And thereby, we can actually follow Mahaprabhu properly. So, in one sense, everybody is pursuing the same ultimate spiritual reality. And when they are pursuing the same ultimate spiritual reality, they may have different conceptions of that reality, they may be at different stages on the path to their ultimate reality. So, sometimes they can take up the path that Mahaprabhu has given, and sometimes they may not be able to take up the path. But the idea is, we connect with them and we encourage and engage them however is possible. Shla Prabhupada, in one sense, was very strong philosophically in countering the, the impersonalist claims of Mayavad. But at the same time, Prabhupada recognized that everybody has the capacity to do seva. So many of the life members who initially came to Prabhupada, they they were followers of different Mayavadi Gurus. I mean, prominent followers of Mayavadi Gurus. Prabhupada didn't get into a debate with them about their particular Gurus, because they were already committed to that path. But Prabhupada engaged them. They helped in building temples. They helped in... Uh, they helped in uh, gaining, re gaining permissions and removing obstacles. They were influential people in society. And Prabhupada engaged them in service. So Giriraj Maharaj once asked Prabhupada that when he met this uh, Dr. Mishra from the yoga studio, that th he had come, when Prabhupada was in Mumbai, he had come, he was visiting India. He was, from, he was based in New York, but he was visiting India. So this Mishra was the person who had hosted Prabhupada oh, for some time when Prabhupada initially gone to New York. So they had, they had lunch together and they had a very cordial discussion. And after that, Prabhupada, Giriraj Maharaj asked Prabhupada that, Prabhupada, wasn't he a Mayavadi? Prabhupada said, 
yes, see, this is philosophically we argue like anything, but culturally we are friends. So, Prabhupada said, now he has just come here to meet me casually and he, you know, he did a good turn to me and the, he did help me in the past. So, this is just a, this is just like a formal social or a cultural meeting. So, they didn't get into too much philosophical discussion. So, so, so there is a time to look at Abhed and there is a time to look at Bhed. So, in today's world, in many ways, say for example, when our devotees were attacked in Bangladesh. So, at that time, we could say that there are many different Hindu groups and we all have our ideological differences. And it's not that the ide ideological differences are not important. The ideology is important. But is ideology, is philosophy the only important thing? No, at that time, as, as, as devotees, we came together with many other Hindu groups and there were especially devotees from Europe and America. They came together with other Hindu groups and they gave submission petitions to the Bangladesh embassy and other places that now devotees should be protected. So yes, that is the time. So when there is an imminent danger to our very existence, then at that time, we don't look at the bhed between different philosophies. We look at the abhed with respect to culture among various, various, we could say, broad Hindu or Vedic groups. So there, Mahaprabhu was that way quite reflective. You know, when to emphasize bhed and when to emphasize abhed. So when it's Jare Dekho Tare Kaho Krishna Upadesh, that is not like converting everyone the way, uh, way the Abrahamic religions have. So, so the idea is yes, Mahaprabhu has emphasized sharing Krishna Bhakti with everyone, but that is with a broader understanding of philosophy. Our understanding is not that only when a person takes up Krishna Bhakti, that, pers that time that person enters into the circle of Krishna's love. Otherwise that person is supposed to go to hell. Hmm? No, it's not like that. You know, actually, in the Christian tradition, this is, I'll conclude with this point, in, in Christianity they have actually re redefined eternity. They say eternity is not a characteristic of the soul. Eternity is a gift bestowed by God. So what that means is that A, because, now this is, this is creative, you could say deviant, because many Christians, they themselves can't digest the idea that how can God send somebody to hell forever? Because that is their idea. If you don't accept Jesus as a savior, you'll go to, go to hell forever. And how can you do that? So, so there are some Christians who have come with this creative idea that actually there is no forever for non-Christians. If you don't accept Jesus, you just stop existing. So hell is not a state of constant suffering. According, they have redefined hell as a state of non-existence. So eternity is not an innate characteristic of the soul. Eternity is a gift given to special souls, those who accept the grace of Jesus. So it's almost like the soul's characteristic changes. The soul is sometimes eternal, sometimes non-eternal. So this is, you could say, a rationalization. But the idea, that is not at all our understanding. Our understanding is whether somebody takes up Krishna Bhakti or not, they are eternally souls, eternally the Paramatma is with them, they are still on a spiritual journey. And Krishna is acting in their lives. Still, even if they are not acting in any way toward Krishna, so we can all act in a way that helps them in their spiritual journey. So Mahaprabhu did emphasize evangelism, we could say outreach, but it is very, it is un, based on a very sophisticated theological understanding of how the Lord is acting in everyone's life and how we can assist the Lord in his actions in everyone's life. So this is the, so now by Prabhupada's mercy, Prabhupada took Mahaprabhu's message all over the world and he fulfilled the prophecy that there will be the holy names chanted in every town and village, which we'll discuss more in, about Prabhupada in our next session tomorrow. But this is Mahaprabhu. He has, India, in, in Bhakti has become transposed and transported all over the world as the legacy of Mahaprabhu. Through, it is not the Sri Vaishnava tradition, it is not the Madhva Vaishnava tradition that has spread all over the world. But it is Mahaprabhu's Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. That has spread all over the world and that has come from the instructions and the prophecy that Mahaprabhu has made. So I'll quickly summarize. I discussed today about how Mahaprabhu trans, uh, transformed the course of Indian history. And I discussed two main points in the acronym CAPS, culturally and attitudinally. So culturally we talked about how Mahaprabhu brought Bhakti outdoors. Bhakti was always resilient 
even in the times of adversity bhakti continued uh, uh, but mahaprabhu made it resurgent bring it out through harinam and that has become one of the iconic cultural images of india across the world ratha yatra and people doing harinam sankirtan and then mahaprabhu changed attitudinally that it is that every devotee has the responsibility to share krishna bhakti to others char dekho tare kaho krishna updesh some might say this is not the vedic tradition well the vedic tradition in, in in form it might not have been there so much but in essence the idea is everybody should be helped on their spiritual journey so when india was overrun by the abrahamic religions which were forcing conversion then use a thorn to take out a thorn but the difference is that it is not that Uh, we say everybody is hell bound if they don't take up krishna bhakti there is a subtle understanding god is acting in everyone's life and when to inspire them to take our path or when to encourage them to continue on their path and even assist them in continuing in their path that is described that is that subtle difference is indicated by mahaprabhu's interaction with different kinds of rama bhakta different two different rama bhakta that we discussed so thank you very much shri gauranga mahaprabhu ki श्री प्रभुपाद की गौर भक्त बिंद की पिताय गौर प्रेमानंदे